Hey everybody, back in the locker room again. Um, we've kind of gone through uh, all of the uh, COVID scenarios uh, and uh, uh, those can be referenced back to in previous sessions. Um, again, our, our theme here has been uh, this idea of uh, whether or not we're under threat or we're in safety uh, determines a a large percentage uh, of our sense of wellness and our overall health. Um, we've discussed that uh, the majority of our physical illnesses, particularly our chronic illnesses, can be attributed um, uh, to uh, high levels of threat, uh, which then convert into uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And, and in the last few sessions, we've talked about that uh, that these pro-inflammatory cytokines are also um, pro-catabolic, so inflammatory catabolic uh, cytokines. We've even named uh, the big family of uh, pro-inflammatory and uh, catabolic cytokines uh, threogens, just sort of lump them all together because it's getting kind of wordy. Um, and we've also talked about uh, that um, that uh, when our pro-inflammatory catabolic cytokines are low and our anti-inflammatory anabolic, think of Arnold Schwarzenegger and anabolic steroids, tissue building, uh, when our anti-inflammatory uh, anabolic uh, cytokines are high, we feel pretty good. Um, uh, we don't uh, have a lot of pain, our mood is good, we're building tissue, uh, we kind of have optimal both physical uh, and uh, mental health in that state. Um, so we're going to take a little bit of a, a deviation away from, uh, uh, from the, the COVID issues and talk about some neurodegenerative uh, issues, uh, again, under the umbrella of the polyvagal theory and, and the cytokine theory, or because it's so pervasive in our body, the cytokines have roles in neurology, uh, immunology, endocrinology, metabolism, psychology, and even how we behave and how we interact in society. So society, so we've kind of called the, the cytokine theory the global cytokine theory and combined the two into a poly, the polyvagal and global cytokine theory of safety and, and threat. Um, so with that, let's let's get up to the board and uh, get it going. Uh, this one is uh, a, a, a little complicated, but I'm going to try to compact it and reduce it down uh, uh, all the way back to threat and safety uh, by the time we kind of conclude. So I'm going to go fairly quickly. Some stuff has been covered many times in previous sessions, but. You know, we'll cover them briefly again like we always do. So, so the issue is threat and what does our body do when it's under threat? And the first thing we have to do is understand what threat is because it comes in so many forms. So threat can be physical, um, you know, an attack. We've talked about lions, tigers, bears, other people, motor vehicle accidents. Those are all physical threats. Injuries, you step on a, a, on a tack and, and that hurts and it sends a, a signal up to your spinal cord, eventually to your brain, but it activates your threat response well before it ever gets uh, to your brain, right? Um, and also we've been recently obviously talking about infections um, that can be a parasite, a bacteria, or in the case of uh, COVID-19, a virus is a, is a threat to our body. And we've talked about this is kind of where our threat system evolved. It evolved to help us survive attacks. It, help, uh, it helped us, you know, boost our immune, immunity, get some uh, inflammation going, get the immune cells to kill the, the virus, the bacteria, the parasite, the, you know, to help us chew up dead tissue and heal up wounds and all that kind of stuff. Um, so um, that's, that's where we evolved. Uh, you know, and that, that is the majority of the threats that, that most animals experience out, out in, in nature. Um, so we adopted that stress response uh, to other forms of threat. Um, uh, a, uh, a category of spiritual uh, threats or spiritual attacks that can be emotional, um, such as abuse, right? Um, it, if somebody is uh, uh, emotionally abused or physically abused, but uh, psychologically abused, uh, their threat system gets activated and they have the same 
uh, uh, neurologic, immunologic, uh, endocrinologic, metabolic, uh, psychologic uh, distress in their, in their body gets triggered by that. Uh, things like uh, social attacks under the spiritual category, we're right in the middle of that right now. So, you know, those social things are, are um, number one, like being isolated or being uh, disenfranchised, um, being discriminated against, uh, 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 acts of injustice are all part of the social illness and disease uh, in, in, the, in the fabric of our society, but they affect us. Uh, individually in terms of our threat response and our overall health. And again, we've talked a lot about um, minorities, particularly um, uh, black men and the, you know, the atrocities, 400 years of atrocities, uh, and what that has done to them, not only uh, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, uh, but also physically in terms of uh, increased risk for certain illnesses and, and increased risk of dying from COVID from a cytokine storm. Um, so in this category as well, we have financial poverty. Living in poverty uh, is a threat and it affects us in terms of our cytokine load uh, and that affects, us, affects how uh, we feel, our mental health, how we behave, our, our kind of social engagement, whether you know we're, we're able to connect with people or whether we're more likely to want to, uh, to fight or withdraw. Um, and uh, uh, financial health is directly related uh, to um, our physical health. And we know from studies, uh, study after study in the hospital, one of the major determinants of outcomes after surgery, you would think it would be, you know, all the medical comorbidities, socioeconomic status. It's uh, people who are under financial stress, living in poverty, who have poor outcomes after surgery. So that's pretty significant. Then we always talk about this because this is such a huge area. Uh, these little black dots up here, I've got a lot going on in the brain here right now, but these little black dots in the brain represent the shadows of the brain and all the activities that's going on in the shadows of the brain and how they poke at our threat stress system and get us cranked up. So we've talked about predictive codes. Uh, you know, if you have had uh, past kind of uh, uh, traumas in your life, you're gonna have predictive coding. You're going to be, we, we're all, all animals are searching the environment for threat versus safety, threat versus safety, making subconscious analysis as to whether or not they're safe or not. And so those predictive codes, if they're biased towards threat from past experiences, or we have a lot of threat in our environment, they are subconsciously gonna poke at the threat stress system and keep it hyperactivated. Um, also traumatic memories, you know, things, the, the emotional uh, traumatic memories of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, past events going all the way back to our childhood um, can continue to poke at the threat stress response and affect our health. And we've talked about adverse childhood events and their high uh, correlation with adult illnesses, and including autoimmune disease and cancer and heart disease and asthma and things like that. Um, and then this other category, is really significant, the suppressions and repressions, and we could even take out of the spiritual social category, oppression uh, that, uh, that we deal with in life. Uh, we, you know, we like to, any negative thoughts, we like uh, to compartmentalize those and put them aside for a while. Any negative emotions, we like to stuff them away, put them aside so we don't have to deal with them. But they don't go away. They create an energy in the shadow of the brain that keeps that stress threat system uh, going. Um, and we've talked about before, the way out of that is expressive uh, activities, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, but I, I want to go back to this, the, the social concepts too on, on the concept of oppression because it's so pertinent today. to today. If you can't be angry uh, because um, anger will potentially uh, put you in jail or get you killed, uh, you know, and if you can't even run, you know, if you decide to flee and they track you down and still put you in jail or kill you, you don't have a lot of choices if you're living under that kind of oppression for survival other than to take that fear, that anxiety, that anger from what you're living through and 
suppressing and repressing it, and that is going to cause poor health. Um, so that's, that, that um, uh, is a real thing, and we can objectify it by looking at inter, interleukin uh, six levels or other cytokine levels, and how they are higher in individuals who are suffering uh, for the, from those types of things. So let's go over here and just kind of uh, move from this side of the board to this side and talk about what actually is happening in the body. We've talked about this. All of these things increase uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, and now we're calling them pro-inflammatory and catabolic cytokines, uh, and, uh, and we get the effects of those. Now, the effects of those are really helpful if we're running from the tiger, but if we're not, and if they go on and chronically for too long and too high a levels, we start to deteriorate. Some of the other things that go along with the pro-inflammatory cytokines that affect our physiology under threat is um, we uh, produce something called vasopressin uh, from the pituitary gland. It's a hormone that helps us to retain water to hold our blood volume in case we get bit by the tiger, in case we're sweating a lot from running, but it's also pro-inflammatory. Uh, it's a little catabolic. It makes us irritable and more angry. Um, and it's, it's alternative uh, 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 hormone to this is oxytocin, which does essentially uh, the opposites. We also um, produce noradrenaline kind of throughout our body, in our nervous system, in our, in our stomach, uh, and particularly from our two adrenal glands. So that's, a, that's an activating um, hormone and in the brain a neurotransmitter that brings us to alert, to attention, gets our heart rate up, gets our blood pressure up, gets our respiratory rate up. And then we also produce something called adrenaline, which is kind of a jacked up form of noradrenaline. It's a little stickier on the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, adrenaline type receptors uh, in our body and it has a little bit more impact. So when we're really in a fight or we're really under flight, uh, we're going to have uh, more adrenaline and some of this noradrenaline will actually be converted to adrenaline to get us jacked up a little bit more. Um, so they come out from the adrenal glands. Does that make sense? Adrenaline and adrenal gland. Uh, they come out from the um, adrenal um, uh, medulla. And then we're going to go down here. I'm going to skip over the renin and angiotensin for just a second to go stay on the adrenal gland. We also put out a couple of hormones, and again, we preferentially are gonna make this one, it's called a, a mineral, a cortico, a mineral corticosteroid, uh, because it helps us hold on to um, salt, to sodium, uh, a mineral, and helps hold our blood pressure. It also kind of participates in the pro-inflammatory um, uh, system. Uh, holding uh, both our blood pressure up as well as our inflammatory response for the fight and flight. And then we throw out from the, uh, the cortex of the adrenal gland uh, also cortisol. That makes sense, Cort, right? Cortisol, cortex. Um, so, and that is really there to help us mobilize uh, fuel sources. So we're gonna, under the influence of cortisol, uh, we're going to mobilize some fats, uh, we're going to mobilize some proteins, which you know, can take away from our muscles and our other tissues, uh, and convert them uh, into a uh, fuel source, which is uh, glucose, sugar, that we can burn and create uh, energy. Okay, And then uh, I'm just going to briefly talk about the kidneys produce renin and something called, an uh, uh, and then the, uh, the renin goes to the liver and produces angiotensin, which also helps hold our blood pressure up. And these things will come be important in a second. But uh, angiotensin, particularly angiotensin II, is also pro-inflammatory. So you can see this kind of state we get into of having sort of a jacked up heart rate, a jacked up respiratory rate, a jacked up blood pressure. If it's a virus or a bacteria, you may have a jacked up temperature. Um, we tend to vasoconstrict to hold our blood pressure. Um, meaning we um, clamp down on, on blood vessels and then we tend to be more inflamed and more catabolic. We're tearing down our tissues in a fight or flight state. So that's not really sustainable. So we, we don't want that to go chronically, but in the modern world, if we're faced with all this, 
we can have that uh, uh, chronically activated system. So let's, uh, let's shift gears here and talk about what happens in the brain under all of these uh, uh, conditions. Um, so as I said, you can, you, know, you can step on attack, ouch, threat response goes up, up the spinal cord uh, to the brain. By the time it hits, uh, even the local tissues are gonna react to that a little bit. There's gonna be a reflex that comes out of the spinal cord, it eventually gets up to the brain, goes through a number of uh, uh, sort of uh, connection points and eventually kind of registers uh, that, ouch, that hurt, but the system is already activated by the time it gets to consciousness. That could be a sprained knee, that could be a bladder infection. It's gonna kind of work the same way. Now, it will activate this little thing that I always refer to as kind of has a lot to do like being our threat stress hub uh, the amygdala, there's two of them in each temporal lobe, and they put out a yeah, sort of a cascade of events uh, that uh, flow throughout the brain um, and even uh, uh, influence the hormones that we talked about uh, going uh, out the pituitary and down to uh, uh, the kidneys and the adrenal glands. Um, so this, uh, the, this uh, little amygdala Let's re refer to that just kind of as our threat stress hub because uh, that uh, it's a little bit simplistic and reductionistic, but that's essentially how it works. Um, when we aren't in uh, under threat and in fight flight type physiology, uh, when we're more in feed and breed physiology, this little nucleus down here, way down in the brainstem in the medulla, the nucleus ambiguous is actually what's lighting up when we're in, in, in safety. Uh, and we see a very different uh, looking uh, physiology, a change, uh, a lot of reduction in uh, these activating hormones and, and uh, more serotonin and dopamine flowing that make us feel good and kind of chill. Uh, oxytocin instead of vasopressin that makes us connect and bond and is uh, anti-inflammatory and anabolic and all that kind of stuff. We see the angiotensin 1 and 2 get converted into things like angiotensin 1-7 and 1-9, drops our blood pressure and drops our inflammatory response. And then we preferentially stop making uh, the aldosterone and cortisol, the two different um, um, threat stress uh, hormones and we start preferentially you know making more uh, uh, testosterone estrogen progesterone our, our sex hormones we're more in, uh, plugged in now with oxytocin and testosterone and estrogen and progesterone uh, to be looking to mate and to uh, essentially breed and feed and uh, eventually digest and rest so um, that, that's kind of a, a, a synopsis of, of that but what else happens in our brain? This is really interesting in neurodegenerative conditions. What else happens in our brain under the threat stress response? Well, we actually um, make a lot of choices under threat and stress for, for sort of the economy of resources or the efficiency of resource allocation. Uh, and so we're not gonna devote a lot of uh, resources to our stomach. So when we're threatened, our gut shuts down, we get constipated, we might even get irritable bowel kind of stuff. Um, um, you know, we're not, we're not hungry, we may have stay full after we eat, we get indigestion, things like that. Uh, as we talked about, we shut off a lot of uh, sex hormones, so we're not gonna devote a lot of en energy or resources to, you know, our ovaries or testicles, things like, things like that. Those things get shut off, but we do something really, uh, interesting up in our brain is we shut up, shut off what I refer to as the neocortex, the part of the brain that makes us distinctly human, the, the newest part of our brain. You know, this is kind of like a reptile down here. We get up into here and it's kind of like, you know, all mammals. But the neocortex for us is, is, is pretty unique. And that's why our heads are so big and our brains are so big. So, um, we make certain decisions about what we need for fight or flight uh, and the things that we don't need, then we, we take them offline so we're not going to actually um, give them a lot of resources. So under the influence of threat and stress, stress this dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex goes relatively offline, okay? And, the, and our 
language centers will also, also go relatively offline. Some of our memory centers in the, in the temporal lobes will go relatively offline. We will preferentially divert those resources uh, to remember the threat, the attack, the trauma, uh, and, and instead of devoting it to things like, you know, birthdays and names and where the car keys are and where you park the car kind of stuff, that kind of stuff gets a little bit offline, but we're, we're much more biased uh, towards, um, you know, being aware of threat in our environment uh, uh, when we don't feel safe. Um, so, so that's really interesting. Now, how does that happen? Well, the pro-inflammatory cytokines play a part in neurotransmission. And so they do have the ability to downregulate our neurotransmitters. They de directly affect uh, our serotonin levels, our dopamine levels, uh, and uh, noradrenaline, uh, noradrenaline levels, uh, acetylcholine levels. So they affect uh, that. Acetylcholine is particularly important in memory. Uh, so uh, that uh, uh, being downregulated is a problem. Uh, downregulating dopamine, we tend to not uh, be feel as good, um, feel as open and uh, approachable and things like that if the dopamine goes down. If the noradrenaline goes down, we tend to be a little foggy and kind of unfocused. Uh, and when our serotonin levels go down, we, we aren't quite as chill. We have more prob problems uh, with uh, connecting with people and, and it affects kind of our, our, our social structure a little bit. Um, so you have all, all of these areas go offline and uh, we downregulated uh, them through neurotransmission and through downregulation of some of the neurotransmitters. But the other really interesting thing is in these parts of the brain, we have a higher density of these uh, what we call adrenergic one receptors. Uh, they're low affinity receptors uh, for uh, noradrenaline and adrenaline. Um, and so when our noradrenaline level gets pretty um, uh, high and our adrenaline level gets really high and it's really sticky on those receptors, they cause a, a decrease in blood flow here. Um, and I, I also put up here, you know, the angiotensin effect, because angiotensin is kind of like a, a little bit of a cousin to cytokines and a little bit of a cousin to noradrenaline uh, and adrenaline, and that it's pro-inflammatory, but it also, in this exact same territory, uh, can do the same thing and decrease blood flow to the neocortex of the brain. Um, so we have this way of downregulating those parts of our brain uh, to devote, devote more resources to our more animalistic, reactive uh, and, uh, part of the brain that helps us in fight or flight. Okay, so that's really cool. Um, let's go all the way over here and then just take a look at, uh, first of all, some of the stuff we were talking about. Once we're in the fight, serotonin is relatively low, acetylcholine is relatively low, our dopamine is still relatively high, and we're increasing our noradrenaline and angiotensin too. Um, once we start to realize we're losing the fight um, and, uh, and our, our dopamine kind of drops out um, and uh, we get a little more jittery and nervous and decide to flee, then we're going to see again low serotonin, relatively low acetylcholine, dopamine's falling and adrenaline, noradrenaline and angiotensin too are still um, rising. Um, now, once we get to a certain level of, uh, of uh, cytokine uh, under this threat, uh, we're going to see a, an interesting flip in our physiology um, where uh, we actually now are going to um, see a drop in serotonin, a, dro a further drop in serotonin, further drop in acetylcholine, a drop in dopamine, and a drop in adrenaline and noradrenaline, and all of a sudden our blood pressure, our heart rate, our respiratory rate are starting to fall. And angiotensin II actually might still um, stay elevated through that. Um, and then when our cytokines get super high, uh, we're gonna get more into faint physiology. Again, where all of our, nor uh, all of our neurotransmitters are kind of dropping out on us. So we're still, once we're into faint, um, you know, we, we're, we have low, metab mo low metabolism, low um, uh, heart rate, low blood pressure, low respiratory rate, low oxygenation, low perfusion. 
Uh, and we've talked about this in a lot of detail with regards to uh, COVID and cytokine uh, storming and the eventual sort of collapse of the system. So that's, that's kind of where we end up in faint. Well, where, why, what happens here uh, at a certain level that causes this flip? Well, we don't really know. You know, I, I could theorize, but I, I won't exactly. But we do know that this little nucleus sitting behind the nucleus ambiguous, this little nucleus, the dorsal motor nucleus that controls our dorsal vagal tone, gets more active. And, uh, and, and between the vagal system and the cytokine system and the, uh, the uh, neural transmission system, um, we see a dramatic change in our uh, uh, physiology. So um, um, with that, I think what we want to do is talk about exactly what we look like, not just all the brain stuff and the chemicals. So if we, if we think about fight or flight, what do we look like in fight or flight? Well, if the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex goes offline, that's, that's where our cognition occurs, our higher level cognitive functioning occurs there. So that's, you know, it's part of attention concentration. Working memory is there where we can hold something in our head and play with it. Um, and, uh, and, and also our ability to reason, do rational thinking, do planning, strategizing, uh, our, create, our creativity is all there. So that, goes, that all goes offline, okay? And then uh, when our ventral medial prefrontal cortex uh, also starts to go offline, then we um, lose that kind of uh, 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 emotional connection and bonding. We don't uh, uh, have empathy um, and, uh, uh, and we tend to be a little bit more you know, selfish in that mode, which helps when you're fighting a tiger. You don't need to be bonding and empathetic with the tiger, right? Uh, and then um, when we get into you know, kind of this part of our brain here and uh, the parietal temporal frontal area, that's where our, our, our human language, which is really unique, unique to us, we have a huge language system, that goes offline. So we have a harder time uh, speaking, right? Uh, and, uh, and actually we have a harder time listening. Uh, we're still pretty good at yelling, screaming, and, and swearing, uh, but uh, our more um, elegant language uh, is offline and not accessible to us uh, in that case. And then uh, in, and we talked already about in the temporal lobe here, where uh, there's a lot of memory stuff going on there, we're gonna preferentially uh, devote resources to uh, the, uh, the memory of the threat, the memory of the attack, the memory perhaps even of the strategy uh, out of that. Uh, that. Um, but um, we're going to take it away from uh, our more functional memory of, you know, birth, the birthdays and car keys and parking spots and people's names and stuff like that. So those things uh, all sort of start to disappear, you know, and they don't go like that. They sort of slowly go away. But you, we all know, you know, the, the, the sayings of, you know, I was so mad I couldn't think or, you know, uh, I, I, I was so anxious I couldn't speak, you know, cat's got your tongue kind of stuff. Um, and so we, we're all pretty aware that these things happen. This is just where they're happening. And remember, this is for uh, sort of resource allocation under threat. Uh, if these things aren't gonna help us fight the tiger or run from the tiger, we're gonna take them on offline because everything's being devoted for our survival. So under these conditions of threat, we can't think, we can't bond, we can't speak well, we have uh, poor aspects of memory, poor attention concentration, we tend to be more reactive, we can be quite restless, we can become hyperactive, we tend to be more rigid, we don't have that flexible, creative uh, kind of thinking. We can be more vigilant, even to the point of getting paranoid. We are more selfish, we tend to be anxious, we tend to be irritable, and we tend to be angry. Okay, so that's interesting. So, let's talk a little bit more. Um, under these conditions, not only have we dropped the circulation uh, to these parts of our brain, uh, we have also the, some of the chemicals that are there, the 
pro-inflammatory cytokines and angiotensin II um, create inflammation in that part of the brain. It's kind of as a side effect of what they're uh, trying to do. And so when you get into neurodegenerative disease and you read the literature, you know, it's all about inflammation. But there's a piece that we're missing, and this is really important. Remember, not so much angiotensin II, but the cytokines, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, you know, the ones that come out under threat are the pro-inflammatory catabolic cytokines, and catabolic means tissue breakdown. Um, and the reason we're breaking down tissue is for fuel. So we're doing that in uh, the sort of non-essential parts of our body when we're under threat. And that has been determined under threat that the neocortical functions are actually really, relatively non-essential. Now, that really applied here under physical threat, you know, uh, sort of our prehistoric major threat. It doesn't work so well when we're under chronic spiritual and shadow kind of uh, threat. We really don't want uh, to be catabolic or breaking down tissue up here in our brain. Um, but we can actually, uh, you know, document that those type of processes that we're, we're going to, when we downregulate some of these neurotransmitters, can, they go back to their, their roots uh, and they actually um, uh, leave more amino acids, the, the building blocks of protein, but in this case, the amino acids are going to be converted to fuel. And um, these particular amino acids are actually uh, converted more into, the, uh, the, uh, in, into ketogenesis or creating uh, ketones for fuel. Um, versus some other amino acids that tend to go more towards glucose. But we, we start breaking these things uh, uh, down, our neurotransmitters down, uh, for uh, actually so we can use them for fuel. It affects our behavior and everything. But, um, you know, it, it's uh, by the time we're into freeze and faint, you can see maybe not acetylcholine so much. Let's kind of take that guy off. Um, but uh, definitely the dopamine... Uh, the adrenaline and nor adrenaline and serotonin have all been broken down uh, so we can have access to those amino acids uh, uh, for uh, ketogenesis and, and fuel so we can survive uh, the, uh, the attack. Um, so the, the other thing though that's happening up in the brain uh, is we're actually, you know, we will take um, proteinaceous tissues in the brain, but more importantly to our nerve cells, our neurons, and our glial cells, the support network for all of the, the wiring in the brain, we um, start to degrade uh, their uh, fat sources. Um, so we're, uh, we end up um, uh, mobilizing things that are very essential for the health of neurons and glial tissues in the brain, uh, which are um, uh, the, the uh, cholesterol uh, that is part of uh, the membranes uh, and part of uh, cellular production um, and overall cellular health. So that becomes a problem. Now, now we've got um, an issue with inflammation up here and we have an issue with um, tissue breakdown. So under chronic threat stress, these are the parts of the brain that we start to see the, the withering of the dendrites of the neurons and the glial cells start to die and leave debris and uh, eventually the neurons can start to die. Post-traumatic stress disorder is very much notable for significant atrophy in the brain uh, in, uh, in these uh, areas. So you go, okay, well, God, that, that's terrible. Yeah, it is, and if it goes on too long, you know, what does it end up looking like? Well, let's turn over here and talk about it. Alzheimer's dementia, right? It presents uh, early on with a lot of this typical kind of memory loss that we were talking about, okay? Um, and it eventually kind of gets up into uh, the, the frontal structures of the brain. Um, 
when we uh, uh, get into the frontal temporal lobe dementias, uh, they tend to attack up here a little bit more, okay, uh, than here. But it's kind of the same, right? It's all the neocortical stuff that's under this influence of threat, stress, pro-inflammatory and pro-catabolic uh, cytokines and uh, a decreased uh, vascular uh, 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 perfusion. So it's all the same. You know, it's like, do you get a gastric ulcer or a duodenal ulcer? You know, you, uh, you, you know who knows which one's gonna pop up more, but it can pop up as more of an Alzheimer type with early memory loss or more of a frontal lobe type with more changes in behavior and, and, and the memory loss comes uh, a little bit uh, later on. Um, you know, and then we have this little band here, right? This is part of it. The language thing is part of that neocortex. And we, we do have this very interesting uh, kind of dementia, primary progressive aphasia, where language goes first. So now we just, you know, we had a gastric ulcer, a duodenal ulcer, you know, now we've got a little colitis, right? It's just a different organ and things pop up slightly differently. Eventually it all kind of ends up looking the same. Okay, then we got this other neurodegenerative disease called Parkinson's disease. And I think this is really interesting. So if you think of these guys up top here, Alzheimer's and all of the frontal temporal lobe dementias, including PPA, uh, they kind of look a lot like fight and flight, right? Those are the parts of the brain that kind of go offline in fight or flight. What happens to us when we go into freeze and faint? Freeze and faint is a surrender uh, physiology. It's, it's one of, of uh, kind of giving up and, and taking a surrender uh, posture, you know, stooping. Uh, slumping over and uh, as we get all the way into faint we end up down on the ground and we're feigning death uh, in that physiology okay so when you look at um, freeze and faint physiology uh, think about uh, the progression through that when we want to we want the attacker to just bypass us the first thing we do is we can kind of surrender the next thing we can do is we kind of withdraw and hide and become immobile and very quiet, right? We don't want to make a peep. We don't want the attacker to see us. And if they do, we hope they think we're, you know, dead or inanimate or something like that. Um, and then as it goes on to faint, we kind of start to uh, dissociate a little bit. Um, and uh, in, in particular, you know, you'll hear a lot of, of women who, you know, say they were, uh, if they were sexually assaulted and, and, and raped, that they, uh, they couldn't move, they couldn't speak, they couldn't yell, they started to dissociate and they actually may have even had a little bit of an out-of-body experience under that extreme uh, threat and uh, attack. Um, so that's kind of the freeze and faint physiology. So what down-regulates there? Well, it's really interesting that, that, you know, this front part of our brain is really devoted to action, making decisions and doing things and moving and fighting and fleeing. Um, and so um, there's a lot of uh, sort of motor activity going on up in, in this area. And this is very deep in the brain. It's, it's kind of clunky because we can't do 3D on a whiteboard. Um, but um, the things that uh, go offline as uh, the cytokine levels continue to rise and, uh, and the stress gets worse, all of a sudden sort of the layer below the stuff we were just talking about starts to go offline. And, uh, and this anterior cingulate gyrus uh, goes offline and, and that has a lot to do with uh, motivation and initiation and, and, uh, and things like that. Um, and then we see the uh, basal ganglia where a lot of our motor movements are controlled uh, uh, going offline. And then the uh, sus substantia nigra, uh, where um, all of our part of a lot of our dopamine stores are there that help us with, with movement. And it's right next to this ventral tegmentum. Uh, and both of those produce a lot of dopamine. Uh, and then not only is the dopamine being cleaved up, uh, but um, the, 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 the manufacturing center and the neural connections uh, for the dopamine are going offline as well.
Um, so what does that look like? It looks like Parkinson's disease, okay? It's a Parkinsonian patient, masked face, right? They're expressionless. Uh, stooped posture, right? Hypophonic. They can barely talk, right? They're almost mute. Uh, they may be a little st st stuttering too. And then they're, they're rigid and have trouble moving. They have trouble initiating movement and sustaining movement. So they're going to get this weird little tremor and then their gait is, you know, they're going to try to take a step and then they'll eventually kind of get going. Well, they look very much like somebody um, who is in this perpetual kind of state of, uh, of, of freeze. They're like frozen, they're rigid. So I think that's really interesting. Now, what we also know about all of these conditions is these people have elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, serum, cerebral spinal fluid, and, uh, and uh, in, in the tissues, it appears that way too. In Parkinson's patients, we know that uh, interleukin-6 uh, is elevated in the anterior cingulate and in the basal ganglia. Um, so that's problematic. It's like this threat response has gone on too long in these people. And now these parts of their brain are uh, inflamed, underperfused, and catabolic. We're breaking down those tissues to use them for other uh, resources. So to me, that is fascinating. I don't know that I can say I'm absolutely, I can, that this is an absolute proof, but it's awfully suspicious, right? It's really suspicious. Now, one of the things that we really get distracted by, I believe, is this idea that um, a certain um, lipoprotein, APO, uh, APOE4, is uh, pro-inflammatory and is actually causing this problem. And uh, if you refer back to, you know, a talk ago or two maybe, and we were talking a lot about metabolism, um, the APOE4 as a, a causative and inflammatory factor I think is a red herring. The reality of the situation is that when we are under threat, um, we start uh, lowering the density of our lipoprotein so we can use them for fuel. And APOE4 is a transporter of uh, fats for fuel, okay? So uh, under when we're in safety and feeling great and healthy and all that, our HDLs are really high. We've got plenty of food, plenty of resources, plenty of sex, plenty of play, plenty of sleep. And we got a lot of HDLs that, you know, really good lipoprotein or really good cholesterol in our body. But when we're under threat, we start to have a lower density and eventually smaller lipoproteins uh, as a delivery system for fuel for the fight or flight, which is going to go more to our diaphragm, our heart, our, our muscles that we're working. Um, so that the, the, the APOE4 issue, um, those people actually, in ancient times, that was great for survival. Right? When you're dealing with the physical threats, that ability to mobilize fuel and get the hell out of there was really important, and they ended up you know, sur surviving. But the problem under chronic threat stress in the modern world is that leads to over-catabolism of these critical brain areas. Um, and, and the APOE4 is part of the metabolic effect of the cytokines, and the cytokines are the inflammatory effect, and APOE4, I don't think it is actually pro-inflammatory. I think it's just the way we mobilize uh, the fuel uh, for the rest of the body. So I think that's a really interesting thing to uh, contemplate. Now, what would we do for this? Well, we spent a lot of time on COVID and how we fight cytokines in the COVID storm, and I argue that many of those same strategies are ab absolutely applicable to neurodegenerative disorders. Um, so we know that sleep is very important for, for uh, restoration. 
eight hours of sleep, preferably uh, a good fast around that, 10 to 12 hours of fasting around that sleep is, is kind of important. Um, and that drops our pro-inflammatory cytokines, drops those pro-catabolic cytokines, elevates the anti-inflammatory cytokines, elevates the uh, anabolic cytokines. We do a lot of tissue repair at night when we get good sleep. Melatonin is very important too. Not only does it help us uh, uh, fall asleep, uh, but it also uh, dampens the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So in the modern world with a lot of ambient light and screens and all that stuff, a little melatonin is perfectly safe and, and acceptable to do. We've also talked before about certain vitamin Bs as being uh, important uh, in suppressing pro-inflammatory cytokines and also very important in our metabolic activity. Vitamin C also suppresses pro-inflammatory cytokines and has some nice um, pro-immunity effects. Vitamin D suppresses pro-inflammatory cytokines and has some nice immune uh, effects. And vitamin K, we always like taking with vitamin D uh, to make sure the calcium uh, mobilized by or uh, absorbed by the uh, by the vitamin D gets put in the right places and not the wrong places like in our arteries and vitamin K2 is also uh, uh, drops our pro-inflammatory cytokines basic stuff right make sure we have adequate levels of magnesium and zinc um, magnesium drops our pro-inflammatory cytokines, drops our blood pressure, drops our, some of the hyperactivity, uh, glutamate-induced uh, hyperactivity in the brain that can, can become toxic. Uh, and zinc is very important uh, for a lot of enzymes in our body, including the production of anti-inflammatory cytokines and the breakdown of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So we don't wanna be zinc uh, deficient and under threat stress, zinc gets used up faster. So we want to make sure we're getting adequate zinc. Cholinergics, the things that work through the um, um, acetylcholine system of our body, uh, they, th those signals in general tend to be anti-inflammatory. They produce anti-inflammatory responses and anti-inflammatory cytokines and the anabolic cytokines. And acetylcholine, is super important in the memory centers of our brain. So uh, getting enough um, uh, of good fatty acids in our diets, particularly phosphatidylcholine, helps us produce enough acetylcholine, but there are some things that we can do uh, to support the cholinergic system. Uh, urocholine uh, being a drug you can give that'll help support that system. And uh, this is a tough one, but nicotine uh, has been demonstrated to have a protective effect uh, in uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And it absolutely makes sense because you have two types of acetylcholine receptors, the muscarinic receptors uh, and the nicotinic receptors. And nicotine sits on those nicotinic receptors, makes us feel pretty good, uh, and uh, it, it ends up uh, elevating our anti-inflammatory and anabolic cytokines, and it is neuroprotective. The problem is it makes us feel good enough that it's uh, addicting, and that's a challenge. But if you're getting into advanced uh, neurodegenerative disease, you know, uh, you gotta uh, kind of go, well, why not? Why not? If we know it's neuroprotective, uh, let's you know, let's let's use it. Uh, and you can do it, you know, through a patch. You don't have to it through your lungs with uh, tobacco um, so and then uh, we've talked about all of these you know these guys here these uh, more um, kind of threat stress uh, responsey uh, hormones that come out um, but the, their counterpart we talked about being um, testosterone estrogen progesterone uh, if we give a little bit of DHEA, a precursor to some of our other, uh, uh, th those good sex hormones, anabolic hormones, and, and let our body um, kind of determine where it goes, that has an, uh, 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 an ability to also drop our pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then we also talked about vasopressin uh, kind of making us irritable, angry, hypertensive, um, and inflamed, well, its counterpart, 
and they look almost identical structurally, is uh, oxytocin. So a little bit of oxytocin can really help uh, drop our pro-inflammatory cytokines and bring uh, um, you know, some of these uh, functions back online. Oxytocin uh, also is anabolic. Uh, you know, people heal faster if they have an injury, if they have adequate oxytocin. So those are you know, relatively simple things to do. We talked about the importance of ketosis uh, as being the primary fuel for healing once we've dropped into kind of that freeze and faint physiology that um, uh, glucose is no longer the preferred fuel, but uh, ketones are the preferred fuel and they're part of our recovery process. So the ketones um, drop these things called inflammasomes uh, and they uh, directly affect the synthesis of the pro-inflammatory cytokines to dramatically shut them down. And we've got a lot of literature out there that ketogenic diets are neuroprotective and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So we want to get away from sugary diets, um, you know, whether it's a strict, you know, kind of ketogenic diet, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be 80% uh, high quality fats, but it, it at least needs to avoid uh, the simple carbohydrates and sugary type foods and probably lean a little bit more uh, towards uh, really healthy fats and an adequate protein supply. Um, but the ketogenic diet is important in neurodegenerative diseases as well. Uh, and, uh, and as it, is in freeze and faint physiology and kind of the end of end stages of uh, of a viral infection like COVID, um, and aspirin's just kind of a good idea, right? If you got uh, you know the the vasoconstricted high blood pressure inflamed blood vessels, uh, one way to kind of counteract that is just take a baby aspirin a day and knock down that inflammatory response and the platelet aggregation that it can occur in your blood vessels. Um, so that they don't, you know, kind of get clogged up. Um, so those are those are really simple things to do. Now, um, if you're um, still, you know, not noticing a significant difference, we we have a lot of information on tetracycline uh, being really great to reduce pro-inflammatory cytokines, and probably particularly the literature. Uh, there's a bunch of tetracyclines. Um, uh, one of them being minocycline. Uh, has been used uh, in neurodegenerative conditions, uh, particularly Alzheimer's, with some success. So you could throw that into the mix. Now, the other thing that is coming online right now, we talked about these at really when things look kind of grim with a, with a COVID-19 crisis to drop the pro-inflammatory cytokines that we can actually target particular pro-inflammatory, let's throw in pro-catabolic cytokines uh, in the mix there. Um, and we can give an interleukin-6 inhibitor and uh, drop the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And that is something that if uh, somebody was really falling, in, fall, falling into uh, kind of severe uh, dementia or, or Parkinson's or, or you know, um, a neurodegenerative condition that we believe is induced by pro-inflammatory cytokines would be something very reasonable to try. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, there are some studies that demonstrate that that does seem to uh, help, as does giving them uh, a tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitor. Um, so um, um, those are the, the, the two that, that, that we could specifically target because we have you know, some literature uh, in that realm. Uh, the other ones that we could kind of consider interleukin-1 inhibitors, interleukin-17 inhibitor, interleukin-2 maybe, I'm not, I'm not so sure that that um, is a little less appealing to me. I'm very curious about phosphodiesterase inhibitors, particularly 4, 5, and 7, uh, and how they might work uh, in this process but because they as well can reduce pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines. And some of the interesting stuff that we talked about before with COVID is glucophage, interestingly, the thing that makes fat cells insulin resistant is the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And glucophage uh, inhibits the formation of pro-inflammatory cytokines, particularly well in the fat cells, and does allow us to pack more fat into the cells, which I 
don't know why we really want to do that, but it makes the blood sugar look better and the hemoglobin A1C look better if we do that. So we think we're making some kind of progress with that, but it does drop pro-inflammatory cytokines and it may have a role uh, in, uh, you know, in, in dementia uh, um, and neurodegenerative disease um, if we can keep the weight under control. Um, interestingly, um, statins also drop pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, you know, they can help to elevate our HDL and improve our LDLs. And we already talked about the, the metabolic role of uh, the cytokines in determining what our lipid profile is. Depending on whether we're under threat or we're in safety, our lipid profile can look significantly uh, different. And then just some other ones that have, you know, come up in, in, in COVID uh, research and may be applicable, glutathione, uh, and acetylcysteine, alpha lipoic acid, they may have a role, their, um, you know, their supplements, and, and they may have a role. So just going back to the, the, we were just talking about the lipid profile being different uh, depending if we're under threat or uh, in a state of safety. Um, so the thing that we can't forget, particularly early on with the onset of these neurodegenerative diseases, is doing this long assessment here, looking at all these threats and determining if people are in threat or safety and starting to correct these things as uh, a first line strategy, a, you know, very much a polyvagal kind of strategy uh, to um, uh, not only prevent neurodegenerative diseases, but, but, but perhaps to reverse them. So physically, you know, are, is somebody obese? Uh, fat cells secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines. That's gonna be a problem. Gotta get that under control. I mean, do they have other, you know, threats in their lives uh, that, that, are, are, that we can actually mitigate um, uh, from a physical standpoint? Certainly, we need to look at the spiritual categories that we talked about and correct those. That's really important. And we need to look at the things going on down here uh, in, in, you know, in the shadows. And we, we put out a thing on, uh, on COVID-19, Plan A and Plan B kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, some of these uh, strategies are, are more well outlined there. I won't go into detail with those, um, but there are resources out there. Stephen Porges and Polyvagal Theory, Dave Hanscom and Back in Control, uh, James Gordon, The Transformation, uh, things like that that could be really helpful uh, in uh, getting this stuff uh, below the physical uh, under better control. Certainly isolation is a big deal, uh, particularly in our elderly and, and uh, can play a big part in the more rapid progression of uh, dementia. And I always like to mention that a moral injury, um, a, uh, a, a social dismissal, um, uh, you know, being rejected actually will elevate your inner leukin-6. Um, so always keep that in mind. Okay, so that's a lot. Uh, the one other thing that I want to throw out there, maybe a little bit theoretical, but I think it is worth con uh, considering. Again, uh, in the modern world, we have this kind of unique phenomenon of, uh, of uh, CTE, um, chronic uh, traumatic encephalopathy, um, from too many hits on the head. And uh, I, I think it would be very interesting to kind of take a look at who's at risk for uh, CTE. CT is a neurodegenerative process. It uh, doesn't show up for about 10 years or so af after uh, people stop playing things like football or boxing and things like that. Um, but it, it has kind of hallmarks of an Alzheimer's uh, type uh, problem. And they also, the people who tend to get it also tend to be better mobilizers, uh, better at being catabolic. Uh, they also tend to have elevated pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines. Um, and I don't know that we really know much about, uh, you know, this kind of stuff uh, in terms of uh, their risk. You know, uh, what burdens are they carrying? How, how traumatic was their childhood? How traumatic has their adult life been? And I do wonder if, if you know, brain injury, which, you know, can set up a, an inflammatory response in the brain, um, that if we're not in a good 
anti-inflammatory state in a good anabolic state that all of a sudden that, that uh, chronic inflammation from getting knocked on the head, you just get a in, inflammatory catabolic degenerative process that uh, starts to outpace the regenerative process. And I wonder if we applied all of this to, um, to post-concussion care, whether or not we could prevent uh, uh, CTE from progressing, uh, even to the point if, you know, somebody has a bad concussion and we do serum uh, uh, cytokine panels on them, perhaps even a cerebral spinal fluid uh, cytokine panel on them, and, uh, and we have enough concern, perhaps a short duration of even getting down into some, uh, you know, more advanced uh, medications uh, like the um, cytokine inhibitors uh, to uh, control that um, and, and see if we could um, essentially take this uh, pro-inflammatory, pro-catabolic wheel and stop the spin, right? And then by doing all these other things, get it going the other way. So now we're actually producing anti-inflammatory and anabolic uh, uh, cytokines uh, and, and have a better chance of uh, repairing tissue. So I think it would be very interesting in doing CTE studies uh, if we um, start doing full um, psychosocial assessments, including all the way back to their childhood, perhaps even generational trauma, um, going all the way back to um, sort of their, their parents and potentially epigenetic transference of, uh, of uh, a tendency towards a more hyperactive threat stress response, whether we might be able to save that game. And uh, as I've talked about before, I used to be a football coach and, and I love the game. It has a lot of great stuff going on in it. You know, um, it's always hard to see somebody break a bone or hurt a knee, um, but I have to say uh, the head injury thing at times started to make me uh, viscerally sick to my stomach and uh, probably had a big reason for me uh, stepping away uh, from, uh, from coaching it. Uh, and so to understand that process better for me personally uh, would be really great. And the fact that, you know, I, I played it for many years of my life um, and I'm um, getting older. So um, all of those things, you know, um, kind of play a part in, in this thought process. Um, but that's, uh, that's at least an initial uh, stab at uh, neurodegenerative diseases. I think there's a lot more to be looked at and a lot more to be discovered and a lot more to be said uh, on this uh, topic in the future. Thank you.